Um, there are several different pests, but I won't cover all of them. So here I've organized the pests according to those that feed on berries on the left hand side and then other pests of berries um, that attack either the kings or the foliage on the right hand side. And so those that are in bold are the ones that I will be covering today. So again, I'll start with spotted wing Drosophila um, and then I'll uh, talk about some of these others. Um, if you're interested in learning about, about these pests in more detail, then uh, you can visit our website and uh, look at some of the fact sheets or guides that we have available. Okay, so get starting um, on spotted wing Drosophila. This is an insect that is native to Southeast Asia. It infests ripening, ripe and overripe soft skin fruit. It is particularly damaging to late fruiting plantings of raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries, but it will also infest cherry, peach, and ornamental and wild fruits. So this insect was first discovered in the U.S. in, two, in 2008 in California, and then we found it in Utah in 2010. So I do run a trapping program for SWD in Utah, and we find them to be pretty abundant in some of our wild habitats, such as in some of our canyons, and then um, in backyard gardens as well. They are present in commercial orchards, but at relatively low levels. Um, despite SWD being in Utah for uh, 10 years now, there have been no confirmed reports of damage. Um, we have received a few sus suspect reports and I followed through with those and it's, it's been something else. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about what that something else is in just a moment. I think the reason why this insect is, is not causing issues in, in Utah is because our climate is hot and dry. And so research shows that SWD prefers moderate temperatures and they are most active at temperatures around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And then their activity uh, is greatly reduced when temperatures are only about 10 degrees um, colder or warmer than this. And then uh, research has also shown that adult survival uh, decreases at relative, relative humidity levels of uh, below 33%. So, um, uh, here's a, a picture of their of their life cycle. So what happens is in the spring, the adults emerge. The current degree model uh, predicts that SWD will begin laying eggs in May in uh, northern Utah. However, um, in Utah, SWD activity begins in late summer. Uh, we typically start finding them in traps in about um, late mid to late August and sometimes even into September. And then they peak uh, in the fall in October. So they are active right now and I suspect that they will peak um, in abundance in, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So the adults emerge from their overwintering sites, um, they mate and then the female uses her serrated ovipositor to deposit eggs inside the fruit. And then those eggs develop into larvae inside the fruit. The larvae feed on the flesh inside the fruit. So the larvae are the damaging, is the damaging life stage. And then um, they pupate either in the fruit or in the leaf litter. And then they uh, overwinter as adults or pupae in fruit, leaf litter, and soil. And then they repeat this life cycle. And so they can complete this life cycle in as little as eight to nine days eight to nine days, depending on the temperature, and there are multiple generations um, possible. So here is a, a picture showing um, an adult male fly. And so you can see that they're really small. Um, they vary in length from about a twelfth of an inch to a seventh of an inch. <clears throat> So as far as identification goes, um, the male is on the right hand side. And so the males have a dark spot on the leading edge of each wing. And so you can see these here. Um, but note that many other flies have spots in their wings, but small flies with just one spot per wing should be suspect. Females are, the female is shown on the left. 
They do not have a spot on um, each wing, but they can be dist distinguished from um, other related flies by looking at their ovipositor or their egg laying structure, which is right here. And then you can see it here. So it's very large and serrated um, in comparison to some of the related um, Drosophila species. So down the picture on the bottom left, the one on the left is spotted wing Drosophila. You can see her ovipositor is much larger in comparison to a related Drosophila species. So these arrows are pointing to that ovipositor. And that ovipositor is what allows that female to attack ripening fruit. Okay, eggs are uh, very small. They are less than about a 30th of an inch long. They're white cylindrical and then the, and they have two thin respiratory filaments on one end. So here on the strawberry fruit you can see a few eggs and then sometimes you can see the eggs underneath the skin of the fruit and then these filaments may protrude from those fruits. The larvae are also very small. They're about a sixteenth of an inch. Um, they vary from a sixteenth of an inch to about a sixth of an inch. So here you can see two larvae here. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we have gotten some suspect reports of, of damage, but when I followed through with those reports, um, they've been millipedes actually. And so this picture shows the millipedes and um, in general millipedes are scavengers that feed on decaying and moist organic matter. They rarely feed on roots and above ground plant parts. But they can feed on overripe fruit, especially fruit that is in contact with the soil, such as strawberries and low hanging raspberries and blackberries. So you can see um, they are long, um, round, multi segmented, and they have two pairs of legs. You can see the legs here on most body segments. Um, and then depending on the species, they vary from about an inch in length to more than 10 inches, and then in color from about uh, a creamy white to even black or brown. So um, if you do follow our newsletters, I recently wrote about um, comparing the two, the millipedes versus the SWD larvae. So if you're interested, you can go and uh, look at that newsletter, um, read more about millipedes uh, in that newsletter article. Okay, as far as um, trapping for spotted wing drosophila, I mentioned earlier that I do run a trapping program. Uh, for this insect and so effective monitoring and rapid identification is critical to responding to these um, to this pest. And so what we use is um, we use a deli cup. Um, so here you can see I, I just actually took a picture of this one uh, this week, uh, but we use this deli cup. We cut some holes in the top of the deli cup. And then you can either use, um, there are a, couple, a few different uh, baits that you can use. One option is to use apple cider vinegar and then a couple of drops of unscented dish soap and that dish soap helps to reduce the surface tension of the, of the um, water so that the, the flies will drown. Another option is you can use a synthetic lure and Century and Trace both have lures that you can um, purchase from them. So here, um, here's one of those um, synthetic lures, but then I use water um, as a drowning solution instead of apple cider vinegar. The nice thing about the synthetic lures is they last about four to six weeks, um, whereas the apple cider vinegar, you would have to change out weekly. You can, you'll have to change out the, the water weekly as well, but, um, uh, uh, but, um, and uh, research has shown that these synthetic lures actually seem to outperform the apple cider vinegar. There are a few other options um, that you can read more about in our fact sheet on, on this insect or in the invasive fruit pest guide uh, to Utah that we have available on our website. So we begin monitoring as soon as the fruit ripens. We actually begin our, I start putting traps out in the field um, as early as mid-May or so. Um, and then uh, be sure to place the trap in a cool shaded area and then service the trap weekly. And so if you are interested in monitoring uh, for this insect, uh, you can look at some of the fact sheets we have and you can read more about the steps um, that you can take in the lab to help you identify this insect. But basically we use one of these um, strainers to help us um, go through those, those um, insects. 
Um, some cultural control options um, uh, are I've listed here. So, uh, for example, you can plant early fruiting varieties such as summer bearing raspberries or June bearing, uh, June bearing strawberries that produce fruit in the spring or summer. Um, you can uh, harvest fruit as soon as they ripen, so that reduces the exposure of susceptible fruits to SWD. Um, uh, good orchard sanitation will help reduce populations that may infect fruit ripening even later in the season or even the following year. Um, you can chill the fruit uh, um, after you harvest it, and uh, this will help stop SWD development and kill many of the eggs and the older larvae. And then if your plantings are small enough, uh, you can even encase them in nettings uh, designed to uh, exclude uh, insects. And you can see um, the, uh, this picture here that shows a netting over strawberries. And then uh, considering that SWD prefers high humidity, um, a, a few options. Um, Michigan researchers have uh, shown that uh, maintaining an open canopy, especially in, in tart cherry orchards, um, it, it helps to reduce uh, SWD infestations. You can also mow uh, the row middle. So if you have a grass alleyway, um, by mowing it at least every other week, uh, Michigan researchers have also shown that that helps to reduce infestations. And then um, you can uh, minimize um, overhead irrigation um, and then even repair uh, drip lines, uh, leaking uh, drip lines, especially if you are concerned about, about this insect. Um, as far as insecticide applications, um, I, they're not needed at this point. Again, we have not found any damage um, due to this pest yet but they may be necessary to reduce the population size in uh, the future. So some key factors to consider um, when uh, you're deciding what to apply. Um, one, have adult flies been caught in the area or have larvae been, been found in the fruit? Is the fruit ripening ripe or is harvest underway? And then of course the need to protect um, are pollinators. So some of the susceptible crops such as raspberries flower and produce fruit over an extended period of time. And so in these situations, special care must be taken to prevent um, uh, the killing of bees and other pollinators visiting uh, the crop. And so you can apply um, insecticides uh, safely during the times of the day when the bees are no longer active on the crop, such as at dusk or at dawn. And that's actually probably a, a better time to um, spray for SWD because during the um, heat of the day, the SWD flies are, are probably not active in the crop. They're going to be active when the temperatures are, are um, more conducive. And so um, for the most part, chemical control par primarily targets the adults before they lay eggs in the fruit because once the um, eggs uh, and larvae are inside the fruit. For the most part, they are, they are protected. Um, you can read more about this insect, again, through these fact, this fact sheet that we have, um, and then this invasive fruit pest guide for Utah that you can download on our website. Um, but some of the insecticides that are effective um, are listed uh, here. Okay, so I'm going to move on now, um, but a couple questions. And so the second question, again, remember, if you're interested in receiving CEU credits, um, you'll need to send your answers to Drew Matthews. So question two is whether um, spotwing Drosophila occurs in Utah. And then question three is true or false, millipedes can feed on overripe fruit that is in contact with the soil. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, now I'm going to start talking about some of the common pests of berries in Utah. Again, I can't, um, I don't have enough time to go over them all, but I'm going to um, bring up some of the, I think, the more common um, ones. So the first one is the raspberry horntail. This is the most prevalent insect infesting raspberries in uh, northern Utah. It's a wood boring wasp that attacks raspberries, blackberries, um, 
and their, their relatives, as well as roses. And these horn tails spend uh, the winter as mature larvae inside the previous year's canes. They then pupate in the early spring and then emerge as adults in um, mid to late May. So the adults mate and then the adult female uses her saw-like ovipositor. Again, the ovipositor is this egg laying device um, and she uses that to lay eggs inside the canes. And it's thought that she lays those eggs near the base of, of the canes. So the eggs then hatch into larvae and those larvae then feed uh, within the cane and then they tunnel upward. So the larvae can uh, be seen by slicing a cane um, lengthwise. Uh, and so here on uh, the, the picture to your right, you can see a larva. So then as the larvae feed, uh, the pith will uh, be packed with this dark colored frass. It looks kind of like sawdust. And so that's basically their, their poop. So the adult, um, again, it's, it's a, a wood boring wasp. It's about a half of an inch to three quarters of an inch long. It's narrow bodied, iridescent black, and then it has these, these long antennae. Larvae uh, range in length during development from about an eighth of an inch to one inch uh, long. And then they are white cylindrical um, and um, white cylindrical and have uh, these uh, dark uh, brown heads. You can't really see it here in this picture. And then a pointy tail with a spine. Okay, so the upward tunneling of um, those larvae and the feeding, uh, heavy feeding of the older larvae can cause the king tip to soften, wilt, wilt, and die back. And so here you can see this wilting. And so in Northern Utah, those wilting kings become um, noticeable in June and July. And so it's easy to verify the insect's presence by cutting open those wilted kings to check for larvae. And so if this was, um, if I saw this in my raspberries, I would cut, I would cut just below the wilting and then peel back the cane and see if I can find a larva. And sometimes you can feel for the larva by um, uh, feeling for a kind of a soft spot in the cane. Um, and sometimes uh, you can even just squeeze the cane um, and then to kill the larva that way. But um, it's good practice to uh, first um, cut back those canes to see, make sure that you uh, see the larva. So it's recommended that you uh, prune and destroy infested kings when the wilting becomes uh, apparent. And so this will remove um, larvae and then reduce the population. And oftentimes um, pruning out infested kings is a sufficient, sufficient management. Um, when you do uh, destroy the kings or um, get rid of the kings, be sure to either burn them or dispose of them um, in a landfill or a trash can. You don't want to um, necessarily throw these in your um, compost pile because the larvae can still develop inside the cane. Um, insecticide applications are um, ineffective against the larvae because the chemicals cannot reach them inside the canes. So if you are going to apply an insecticide, um, be sure to do that before um, uh, when the adults are active before they lay eggs inside the cane. So it's recommended that you apply those insecticides um, when uh, new growth begins. And so I've listed some of those, um, those insecticides that are known to be effective here. So synthetic pyrethroids, carbaryl, amalathion, and um, uh, spinosad, which is an organic option. And then if uh, populations are high, uh, a repeat application can be made um, one to two weeks later, depending on the product that you're using. Um, and then again, just a reminder, don't treat um, with insecticides just before or during bloom um, or when the pollinators are active. Okay, the next pest is the rose stem girdler. This is another um, pest that's common in central and uh, northern regions of Utah. I've seen this at, out at my place. Um, it's also known as the bronze cane borer. It is native to Europe and parts of Asia, but again, it is common here now. So like horntails, um, 
This beetle spends the winter as a mature larva in the previous uh, year's canes. They pupate in the early spring, and then they emerge from um, the, um, the canes as adults in the spring, anywhere from about May, uh, May to June. So in um, late spring, the females then um, lay their eggs near the base of the canes, and then the eggs hatch, and then the larvae tunnel um, tunnel um, upward, um, feeding on, on the cane. And then they remain inside the cane uh, throughout the winter. So first year canes are attacked uh, more than uh, uh, the fruiting canes. So the adults are pretty small. They're about a quarter of an inch um, long. They're bronze colored. Uh, they have a, a flat head um, and they're metallic. The larvae are, and you can see the larva uh, right here. The larvae are white. Uh, they're slightly flattened. They, I think they look kind of like a tapeworm and uh, much smaller though. And then they, they have two short brown tooth projections on the tail end. And then depending on their, um, their length or their age, they uh, vary in length from about a quarter of an inch to uh, three quarters of an inch long. And so larval feeding um, in the cane causes uh, spiral grooves and gall-like swellings. So you can see some of these spiral gro grooves and um, swellings here. Um, and then injured canes may uh, also wilt and break off and have um, foliage that appears uh, scorched. So here you can see some of those pictures. And again, the, the canes may break off. So some cultural control options are to avoid planting um, the berries uh, stands near roses or remove um, the roses that are nearby. Again, roses are alternate hosts. Um, but the best um, treatment option is to, um, like uh, with the raspberry horntail, is to remove and destroy those infested canes. Um, and you should do that um, throughout the season, late in the season and over the winter. And then um, same thing um, with raspberry horntail. If you are putting on a, a spray, that should be timed with adult emergence in the spring so that you um, uh, get them before they uh, lay the eggs on the canes. And so the applications um, should begin in early May or just before bloom. And then you can uh, um, add, um, reapply the product depending on which one you're using. Um, and you'll wanna do that through about early June. Okay, the next one is raspberry uh, crown borer. This is a, another um, a common pest. It's actually a moth. Um, it can attack all um, brambles, but it's only known to cause damage to raspberry in Utah. Uh, so it does have a two year life cycle. So it spends much of it as a larva tunneling in the lower cane. Um, and the crown and the roots of the plants, and then the larvae tunnel upward the second year, and then the adult moths emerge in summer to fall. So uh, after the adults merge, they mate, um, and then the females lay eggs singly um, on the underside of leaves, and then those eggs hatch in late summer and early fall, and then the young larvae crawl down um, the outside of the cane to the crown, and there they um, build a uh, protected cell just, be, um, just beneath the soil surface. And then the following spring, uh, the larvae chew into the crown and upper roots to feed. And they feed heavily during the summer and then they spend their second winter. Um, and then in the second spring, they uh, bore upward. Um, so the adults, you can see the adult here, those are, um, again, they're moss, they're stout bodied. Um, they could uh, um, be mistaken as a yellow jacket and I'll talk about yellow jackets in, in just a moment. Um, but these adults have um, banded black and yellow bodies, um, but they also have these transparent wings um, or wings with brown borders. So the larvae <clears throat> are white with a dark head um, you can see a larva here, and they uh, range in length from about a quarter of an inch to one and a quarter uh, inch long. So uh, raspberry crown borer infestations are usually not severe, um, but the populations can um, <clears throat> build up slowly over several years 
um, reducing uh, the, the, the yield of those plantings. So uh, the first indication um, of, of, uh, of this pest is uh, wilting um, and dying of foliage. And you'll see that around April through June or so. And you may also see infested canes that uh, curl uh, into a shepherd's crook. And then these damaged canes may also um, become spindly and break at ground level. So here you can see some wilting foliage and a cane that looks um, uh, spindly. So uh, like the other two pests I just mentioned, um, control options include removing and destroying the, those infested canes as well as the alternate hosts. Um, you can also plant resistant varieties. And so um, our fact sheet covers uh, the uh, resistant, resist, resistant varieties. Um, and then uh, chemical control options um, efforts should be directed at the first year larvae either in the fall, so in mid-October as they crawl down uh, the kings to overwinter or in the early spring, um, so about April to early May um, before they tunnel um, into the crown. And so you can apply a full king spray um, and drench to the base of plants, allowing that insecticide to soak in into the root zone. And you can use the same insecticides that um, that I mentioned for raspberry horntail and uh, rose stem girdler. <clears throat> oh, one thing I um, forgot to mention is for um, for this insect, um, treatments should be applied for at least two or more consecutive years for for successful control. Again, they have this two-year life cycle. So, okay, so um, this is the fourth question. Um, so true or false? I've got a couple more pests to cover, um, but go ahead and answer this question if you're um, interested in CEU credits. Okay, so the next pest I want to talk about is Western flower thrips. Uh, these are uh, very tiny insects that use piercing sucking mouth parts to feed on fruit buds, flowers, and fruit. Uh, they also feed on hundreds of different weed and crop hosts. So they overwinter as adults, and you can see an adult here. Um, and they overwinter in debris around host plants, and then they emerge in the spring to feed on and lay eggs uh, within the flowers. So then the eggs hatch, and then the nymphs feed on um, uh, plant tissue, pollen, and nectar, and then they remain in uh, the blossom uh, clusters. So as I mentioned, adults are really tiny. They're about a 20th of an inch long. Um, they have these feathery wings. You can kind of see the, the feathery um, covering on these wings. Um, and then they vary in color from about pale yellow um, to even a dark brown. So the larvae are even, even smaller. Um, so here, here's a, um, a larva. It is about a 50th of an inch long. They're tubular in shape and they're uh, translucent white um, to yellow. And so many uh, generations per year are, um, occur and um, populations can increase rapidly during uh, fruit bloom. So these are pests um, uh, that are an issue during the early part of the season. So these uh, pictures show some of the um, symptoms that you may see with thrips, um, at least on small fruit. Um, so these thrips can cause uh, flowers to abort or wither, such as shown here. Um, they can also um, result in feeding, um, can also resort in distorted fruit with pronounced seed, such as this, um, you can see these pronounced seeds on the strawberry. Um, they cause surface russeting around the cap and seed, so you can see that here. And then they can also cause scarring injury to um, the flower petals, and this is a sweet pea that has um, thrips damage. They can also transmit diseases and so it's recommended uh, for monitoring that you use sticky traps, um, um, uh, either white, yellow, or blue. So this is a, a trap that was placed in the onion field for a different thrips, onion thrips, um, but you can use the same type of design. Or you can hang uh, a sticky trap in, in, um, um, in uh, nearby trees. 
Um, you can also monitor thrips on host plants using a paper test where you basically take a piece of paper next to the plant and then um, shake uh, that the foliage onto the white piece of paper and you can look for thrips that way. Or you can even use a hand lens to count the thrips. As far as control, um, biological control, there's, there are really no significant natural controls early in the season. Um, but later in the year, uh, predators such as those, those shown here um, uh, may help to keep um, thrips populations down. Um, uh, cultural control options are to control flowering weeds around um, the plantings. Um, however, if other uh, flowering plants with uh, these desirable flowers, so for example, flowers that are yellow, white, or blue colors that they're attracted to, if those are um, nearby um, and in bloom at the same time as, um, for example, strawberries, then allowing these um, to flower may help to reduce activity uh, in the strawberries. Uh, as far as chemical control, um, sprays should be applied before blooms open or after petal fall, um, and uh, in part to reduce uh, bee injury. And then I've shown some of the um, the insecticides that are known to be effective against thrips here. Okay, um, the second to last pest I want to talk about is the European paper wasp. This is actually an invasive wasp that is well adapted to Utah conditions. And I think they arrived in Utah in the late 1990s and they seem to be here to stay. I know this is um, an insect that I'm, I've, I deal with at my place. Um, so they're, they're really common. They are uh, um, considered predators during the early, during the spring and early summer, but later in the, the um, mid uh, to late summer and even into fall, they do feed on, on ripe fruit. Uh, fortunately, they do not attack aggressively unless, um, of course, they're in danger or they feel that they're in danger or provoked. They build these upside down umbrella shaped um, open celled nests and they put those nests um, under eaves and other uh, protective structures. The adult queens overwinter um, and then they construct nests and provision young uh, in the spring. So the dominant females um, are the principal egg layers and then the subordinate uh, males um, or females or, or workers are, are primarily uh, foragers. Uh, they do not lay eggs. So um, this, uh, the European paper wasp may easily be mistaken for uh, as a yellow jacket. And so the yellow jacket shown here on the left versus the European paper wasp on the right. So yellow jackets are uh, predators, scavengers. Um, they dwell in trash bins um, and they eat people's food, which is why they're considered a hazard. They will hunt for um, more sugary food as the season uh, changes though. Uh, they have a chunkier body um, than the European paper wasp. They have more yellow than black. And then if you look at the antennae, the, they're black, whereas the European paper wasp has an orange tipped um, antenna. Um, they, uh, the yellow jackets are, are more aggressive, so they will defend their nest and they do have the tendency to attack repeatedly and aggressively. So um, again, the European paper wasp has these orange um, tipped antennae, they're more slender and they build um, umbrella shaped um, uh, coverless nests, whereas the yellow jacket, um, I forgot to mention, but then the yellow jacket builds um, covered nests underground. Um, so they're not the ones that are building the umbrella um, nests that you uh, see around um, structures. <clears throat> so um, for controlling the European paper wasp uh, in your um, raspberry plantings or um, fruit plantings, um, traps do seem to work. And so it's recommended that you uh, make a homemade trap um, uh, and then place that trap around the perimeter of the garden and yard area away from human activity. And so you can use a plastic liter bottle uh, shown here where you basically cut off the top of um, at the shoulders um, and then turn that top over um, and invert it. So it makes a funnel instead. Um, and then bait that uh, trap with diluted fruit, 
fruit juice at a one to 10 ratio, one parts fruit juice, 10 parts water, and then a teaspoon of yeast and a piece of uh, ripe fruit to excel fermentation, and then add a couple of drops of unscented um, dish soap. Um, I forgot to mention, you'll want to also punch holes on the side so that you can uh, use something to hang that, that trap with. So the yellow jacket traps are the ones that you can buy um, um, at Home Depot or Lowe's or, or Walmart. So this is a, um, the, the picture on the bottom right is a yellow jacket trap. Those are not effective for the European paper wasp. Um, but they are, um, they are, uh, can be used for yellow jackets if you know you have problems with yellow jackets. As far as chemical control goes, um, you can treat the nest with aerosol wasp sprays um, and then wait uh, at least 24 hours and then remove that nest. And it's important that you remove the nest because these um, paper wasps will uh, put their own chemicals on the nest to attract other females uh, to build nests in the same location. So be sure to remove those. Okay, the last pest I want to um, um, go over are spider mites. So these are um, small web spinning arthropods that are actually more cl closely related to spiders and ticks than to mite or than to insects. Um, they are a very destructive group of pests to agricultural crops worldwide and so they feed on a lot of different um, hosts including fruit, tr fruit trees and uh, berry plants. So the adult females overwinter under bark or organic matter on the soil surface and then uh, they emerge uh, in the spring and then they start feeding on uh, ground cover plants and leaves um, that are near the bottom of the plants. So uh, they bait um, and then uh, egg laying starts a few days after feeding begins and so a single female can lay over uh, 150 eggs in her lifetime. And um, a generation can um, be completed in as few as uh, 10 to 14 days during um, the hot summer periods. And so uh, you can see that this makes for um, a lot of mites in just a relatively short amount of time. Um, and then um, note that populations increase rapidly under hot, dry conditions. So this picture here is showing the two-spotted spider mite, which is a, a very common mite that we have here. <clears throat> the adults are about, they're really, really small. They're about a 60th of an inch long. They're oval. And when they overwinter, they're orange um, uh, without spots. And then they turn to green once they uh, start feeding in the spring. And then as they get um, older, they, they turn to a, more of a brown color. So the summer adults have uh, two red eyes. You can kind of see them here. Um, and then two distinct dark spots on, on, on the back. Um, okay, so feeding, um, spider mite feeding can cause this white stippling uh, and bronzing. Um, so here's some stippling, bronzing, and then even defoliation. So here's some bronzing on some strawberries. Um, once you see the bronze um, foliage, uh, that's actually considered irreversible, so the damage is, is, is done at that point. You may also see some um, webbing on, on the leaves and twigs, and this webbing and then um, other, um, coupled with other injury symptoms can cause those leaves to look really dirty. So the fruit color size and production um, can also be reduced. Um, and then uh, infestations usually begin on the lower uh, part of the plant. And so, um, <clears throat> and then the infestations move upward. So a key time to suppress the adults is during um, early to midsummer before um, uh, they really start producing a lot of eggs. So you can use the paper test that I mentioned earlier where you shake the mites onto a light colored surface uh, to look for their movement and then again note that um, select the lower leaves since that's where the infestations um, begin. And then you can use a 10 to 30x uh, magnification hand lens to, um, to uh, identify adults, um, uh, nymphs, and, and the egg stage. Um, but do, if you do use the paper test, um, watch for predatory mites um, because uh, they can help prevent spider mite densities from, from exploding 
So um, predatory mites are generally fast moving mites um, and they're about the same size as uh, the, the uh, two spotted spider mites and other uh, pest mites. So if you do notice um, predatory mites, um, then uh, treatments may not, a treatment may not be necessary. Okay, so <clears throat> the spider mite status um, as a pest is often uh, created by uh, poor management practices, such as using broad spectrum um, pesticides and then uh, not properly managing um, weeds and um, ground covers. So um, avoid uh, avoidance of these non uh, selective uh, pesticides and then uh, proper um, weed and ground cover management are, are uh, really essential for um, spider mite um, um, uh, control. Some other options are to um, uh, reduce heat um, uh, and that can help lower the risk of spider mite infestation. So they tend to, um, their populations tend to explode when it's really hot out. So uh, for low growing uh, crops, um, consider installing uh, shade covers to cool the plants. Uh, and again, that will help reduce mite population. Uh, you can also plant a, a hardy uh, grass um, uh, alleyway uh, between the uh, crop rows um, and that will help keep um, temperatures down. And then also the spider mites uh, do use some broadleaf weeds. And so by getting rid of those broadleaf weeds um, and focusing on, on the grass will help. Um, and then the uh, grass alleyway uh, helps to also reduce the dust, which provides a barrier <clears throat> to uh, spider mite um, um, uh, predators and increases the, the uh, temperature of the leaf uh, surface. You can also use overhead watering um, to help reduce uh, the dust and then lower the, the temperature of the foliage. Um, avoid plant stress, so uh, uh, plants that are more stressed due to drought or um, nutrition or um, uh, have herbicide injury um, are more uh, susceptible to pests such as uh, the two-spotted spider mite. And then uh, uh, um, you can also select cultivars that have hairy leaves and that actually um, those hairy leaves will deter mite feeding. Um, and then if you do notice um, problems with spider mite, um, you can also, uh, uh, it's recommended that you use uh, softer products um, and sometimes even just a spray of water uh, will, uh, will um, help control them. But some, um, some uh, uh, things that you could use to help control some chemicals include um, I don't have them on the slide, but you can use uh, insecticidal soap, horticultural oil, or even uh, neem oil. But miticides are not, um, are not really recommended um, because um, they can uh, create other problems and they also do um, uh, kill the predatory mites as well.